Honourable Members, the President. Honourable Members, are there any questions? Yes. Okay, thank you, members. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thank you, President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is the Minister for Mental Health representing the Treasurer. No? Okay. I refer to the two day Communications Electrical and Plumbing Union Western Power Strike last week and to the pre election financial position statement, which highlights, and I quote, a global provision has been included in this PFPS aggregates to reflect the estimated financial impact of an ongoing industrial negotiation and that the quantum of the provision cannot be disclosed at this time pending the outcome of negotiations. And I ask, one, how much is the provision budgeted in the PFPS and what, are, and what EBA wage increase does this equate to for CEPU workers? Two, are Western Power CEPU workers covered by the government's wage policy? And if so, will the only offer being made be $1,000 per annum, as was offered to police, nurses and doctors? Three, will the McGowan and government ensure that further disruptions do not occur if this union does not accept the wage offer put forward by the government? And four, if not, why not? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some knowledge of the question. The following answer has been provided to me by the Treasurer. One, the provision referred to totals $36 million over the period 2021 to 2022 uh, to 2023-24 and relates to the government's decision to employ an additional 400 graduate nurses over the next two years. None of the provision applies to CEPU members who work for Western Power. Two to four, the government's expectation is that government trading enterprises comply with the public sector wages policy. Western Power has been negotiating with the CEPU for nearly a year and remains open to further meetings. Western Power is seeking a fair and reasonable outcome for Western Power's CEPU employees that is in line with community expectations, industry standards and the public sector wages policy. The Leader of the Opposition. Madam President, uh, my, oh, okay, oh, sorry, President, thank you. Uh, this may have been shifted. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Regional Development, so I presume the Parliamentary Secretary has got it, uh, representing the Minister for Energy. I refer to the McGowan Government's commitment to employ apprentices at Western Power and I ask one, what is the number of new first-year apprentices employed in 2020 and 2021? Two, what is the total number of apprentices first to fourth year employed in 2020 and 2021? Three, how many apprentices completed their training in 2019 and 2020? And four, how many apprentices that completed their training in 2019 and 2020 are still employed by Western Power? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Regional Development. Uh, thank you, President, and uh, I thank the Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question. And on behalf of the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Energy, provide the following response. One, it is not possible to provide 2021 numbers in the time provided. 2019 and 2020 numbers have pre provided for this response. However, 2021 numbers will be made available later this week. Western Power employed 16 new first-year apprentices in both of 2019 and 2020, in line with the McGowan Labor government's election promise. Over and above apprentices, Western Power also takes on graduates, trainees and apprenticeships and pre-apprenticeship scholarship opportunities per annum, creating multiple training opportunities for West Australians of different educational backgrounds and electrical training experience levels. In addition, Western Power also employed additional higher year apprentices in 2020 who were released by, by prior employers during the early months of COVID-19 through no fault of their own. Uh, President, sections two and three of this answer are in tabular form and I seek to incorporate them in Seek leave to incorporate them into Hansard. Member seeks leave to incorporate that table into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. President, section uh, part four, all apprentices that required their training in 2020 are still employed by Western Power. As per question three, no employees completed their training in 2019 due to an initial intake of nil in 2016. Uh, the Honourable Colin de Grosser. Thank you, President. And I believe this question has been redirected from the Minister for Small Business to the Minister representing the Minister for Finance. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Finance. I refer to the $100 million land tax assistance package for commercial landlords announced in 2020. And I ask, one, how many applications have been received since the scheme started? Two, what is the dollar value of applications received from landlords to date? 
Three, how many grant payments have been made? Four, what is the total value of these grant payments to successful applicants to date? And five, how many rounds of payments have been made and what was the average payment for each round? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, Madam President. Thank you very much, President. I'll get used to it. Apologies, President. Uh, can I thank the Deputy Leader of the Opposition for some notice of the question? It has been referred to the Treasurer, uh, and so I'll provide this answer on the Treasurer's behalf. Uh, information is not possible in the time required for today. However, the Treasurer will provide a response to this question tomorrow. The Honourable Yuan Sibma. Uh, thank you, President. Um, my question, without notice of which some notice has been provided, is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. Uh, question C162. I refer to admission and discharge practices as they apply to mental health patients at QE2 Hospital, and I ask one: Are there system or resourcing constraints which impede the discharge of patients on a Friday evening or on the weekend? Two, as a corollary, are there system or resourcing constraints which impede the admission of new mental health patients on a Friday evening or on the weekend? And three, if yes to one and or two above, what is the nature of these constraints? Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. Uh, the following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, one, no. Two, no. Patients can be admitted on any day of the week, 24-7, if, if they are assessed as clinically needing a bed. Beds are sourced in accordance with the state bed management policy. Three, not applicable. Uh, the Honourable Nick Goran. My question without notice of which some notice has been given is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Child Protection. I refer to the National Principles for Child Safe Organisations, in particular National Principle No. 8 that states physical and online environments promote safety and well-being while minimising the opportunity for children and young people to be harmed. One, is the Minister aware that as of 1 February 2019, the Premier, on behalf of the state, confirmed his commitment to the National Principles for Child Safe Organisations? Two, is the Minister aware that the eighth principle, principle seeks that physical and online environments promote safety and well-being? while minimising the opportunity for children and young people to be harmed? Three, is the minister aware that public schools are intended to be captured by these principles? Four, has the minister had any discussions with the Minister for Education about the continuing volume of cases where alleged or convicted offenders are attending the same school as their child victims? Five, if noted four, will the minister undertake to expedite such a discussion and report to the House on the government's revised plan to address the national principles? The Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Child Protection. President, I thank the member for some notice of the question. One to three, yes. Four to five, yes. The Department of Communities and Department of Education continue to work closely to manage the risk of children and young people displaying harmful sexual behaviours in an education setting using the multi-agency protocol for education options for young people charged with harmful sexual behaviours. The member fails to understand the protocol in place to respond to these matters or the Department of Education's role in progressing work related to the national principles. The Honourable uh, Order. Question, order. 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 The Honourable Donna Farrago. Thank you, President. President, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the Minister's letter dated 17 November 2020 to the Standing Committee on Environment and Public Affairs in relation to petition number 164, and specifically the statement on page 2 of the attachment which states, the decision to build elevated rail instead of tunnelling underground was made after a detailed study of several options. And I ask, will the Minister table the detailed study undertaken? Leader of the House. President, uh, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question and note uh, and wish her a happy World Redheads Day. Um, the study of options is undertaken as part of the business case and project definition plan process. It is noted that the opposition has refused to approve the release of the Forestfield Airport link project definition plan to the government. The Honourable Peter Collier. Oh dear. Um, my question with that notice, which someone has given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Premier. I refer to your response to question C150 on Tuesday, the 25th of May 2021, and to the Lottery West letter delivered to the Chairperson of Victory Life Community Services on dated 7th of October 2020. And I ask, one, will the Premier confirm that the words, quote, on the basis that your publicly stated beliefs and as founder and chair of the organisation do not align with to this commitment, were removed from the draft letter prior to delivery. Two, if yes to one, why were these words removed and who made the recommendation that they be removed? And three, what component of the draft letter uh, 
of the draft letter was the chair of Lottery West referring to when he wrote, quote, thanks for sending that to us, Susan. I think that looks good and have only one suggested amendment to paragraph four of your letter, i.e. to remove the first sentence and shorten the second sentence. Leader of the House. President, I thank the honourable member for some notice of a question. One no. See answer three of the Legislative Council question without notice 144. Two not applicable. Three, I refer the honourable member to FOI document 309, which he received on the 8th of January 2021. The Honourable Wilson Tucker. Thank you, President. My question without notice is to the Minister for Mental Health, representing the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the WA Government's COVID-19 vaccination dashboard, dashboard, and I ask, can the Minister provide the current total number of COVID-19 vaccinations administered and the current rate of vaccination for those aged 16 and over for the following regions? The North Metropolitan Region, the South Metropolitan Region, the East Metropolitan Region, the Mining and Pastoral Region, the Agricultural Region and the South West Region. The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answers will be provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, it is not possible to provide the requested information in the time required, and I therefore ask the Honourable Member to place this question on notice. So, Honourable Member, if, if you sign the bottom of it, place it on notice, I will see if I can get an answer sooner than the on notice process to provide to you. Okay. Is everyone finished? The Honourable Brian Walker. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer the Minister to the report by Jack Jacob Kagi on the ABC's website on 22nd of May 2021, in which doctors at Midland Hospital warned in no uncertain terms that patients would die because of proposed multi-million dollar budget cuts. And I ask, what? Is it true that Midland Hospital's budget is to be slashed by more than $10 million for the 12 months from 1st of July 2021? Two, if yes to one, did the East Metropolitan Health Service consult with the Minister or any of his senior advisers ahead of making this decision? And three, given that the proposed cuts are almost certain to lead to redundancies and to fewer doctors and nurses being rostered on each shift, will the Minister call this decision in for immediate review? And if not, why not? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, I have been advised that further time is required to answer this question, so this information will be provided to you tomorrow, the 27th of May 2021. The Honourable Martin Aldridge. Thank you, Madam President. My question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health. I refer to Legislative Council question without notice 136 asked yesterday in relation to cost recovery from hotel quarantine. Ask one, is a hotel quarantine person issued an invoice when leaving hotel quarantine or at another time? Two, what are the standard terms of payment, including any applicable interest rate applied to overdue amounts? Three, how many invoices remain outstanding and what is the total, total amount outstanding? Four, of those identified in three, how many invoices have been A, have been issued A within 30 days, B 31 to 60 days, C 60 days or more. Five, what further charges are incurred by hotel quarantine persons when they are directed to quarantine for a period exceeding 14 days? The Minister for Mental Health. Thank you, President, and I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The following answer is provided on behalf of the Minister for Health. Uh, one, invoices are issued to passengers after they have completed hotel quarantine. Two, standard payment terms are 30 days. No interest rate applies to overdue amounts. Three, as of 30 April 2021, a total of 5,865 invoices valued at $19.5 million are outstanding. Four, A to C, to date all invoices have been issued within 60 days or more. Five, no additional charges. The Honourable James Hayward. Uh, thank you. My question, without notice, uh, to which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Transport. I refer to the northern interchange of the Bunbury Outer Ring Road, the Bore, and I ask, has the design changed uh, since plans for the Bore were first drafted, and if yes, on what dates did this occur? Uh, two, does the design of the northern interchange of the Bore have pr provision for a rail corridor? Uh, if yes, when will the community be shown plans for how that corridor interfaces with the road network? Three, will the, co the corridor require a tunnel to be constructed under the interchange? If so, what is the expected future cost to build that tunnel? And four, given the federal and state governments are co-funding an inquiry into the future passenger rail needs for Bunbury and the South West, will the construction of this interchange affect the feasibility of a proposed rail route down the Forest Highway and onto Bunbury? The Leader of the House. 
the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. One to four, the McGowan government has allocated $3.4 million towards a high-level investigation into a faster train to Bunbury and potential corridor options will be considered as part of this process. The design does not preclude a future railway line in the centre of Forest Highway if this is deemed to be the preferred option. The Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. Uh, uh, Thank you, President. Uh, and my question without notice for what for which some notice is given as the Minister representing the Minister for Land. I refer to reports of uh, booming property prices and housing shortages in towns across regional WA and a report in the West Australian on 22nd of May stating there was a 42 per cent growth rate in the price of a median house in Port Hedland over the last 12 months. And I ask uh, what specific uh, reference to, uh, with, with specific reference to Port Hedland and Kalgoorlie, can the Minister outline how many lots are currently available for sale, how many lots are approved for subdivision and how many hectares of an urban and globo land are available for subdivision in the future, and two, what actions are w Development WA undertaking to ensure these lands are fast-tracked to the market? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Regional Development. Well, thank you, President. And I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. On behalf of the Minister for Regional Development, representing the Minister for Lands, I provide the following response. 1A, Port Hedland 174, Kalgoorlie 34. B, Port Hedland nil, Kalgoorlie 31. C, Port Hedland 197.1 hectares of future residential land. Kalgoorlie Development WA has 430 hectares of future resi residential land. Since the regional land booster was announced on the 15th of July 2020, Development WA has sold 11 residential lots in Kalgoorlie, 13 in Port Hedland and 3 in South Hedland. They are still all available under the booster prices in these locations. 2. Port Hedland. Development WA recently partnered with the Town of Port Hedland to secure two new structure plans in Port Hedland and is progressing an options analysis over seven sites in Port Hedland and South Hedland to inform the location for future residential development. Kalgoorlie Development WA is currently procuring a contractor to develop the next 31 residential lots at Greenview Estate, Kalgoorlie, to support private lot supply. The Honourable Steve Martin. Thank you, President. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Community Services. I refer to the recovery effort in areas of the Midwest affected by Cyclone Saroja, and I ask one, is the Minister aware how many temporary homes are required to house people who lost their homes in Cyclone Saroja or, or who have moved to the area to assist in the rebuilding process? Two, can the Minister advise how much of that housing has been delivered? Three, if the available temporary housing is not sufficient, when will the Minister deliver the necessary housing? Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister for Housing. Community services. Community services. Thank you, President. And I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Uh, one to two. The, to date, a total of 19 households, 49 people, have requested accommodation assistance. All of these households have been provided with temporary emergency accommodation. Currently, a total of three households, 10 people, continue to be supported in temporary accommodation. Under the state emergency management arrangements, considerations around reconstruction efforts mm including workforce accommodation, is the responsibility of the State Recovery Controller and relevant local government authorities. The Department of Communities, through the State Recovery Controller, is working with local governments to provide outreach and case management services to affected communities and identify any immediate or emerging welfare needs. Additionally, the Insurance Commission of Australia is assisting local governments in assess assessing the breadth of damage and number of uninsured households. Three, housing demand is anticipated to change over time as issues emerge. The State Recovery Controller is working with the local government authorities, community members and state and federal agencies to develop a number of recovery packages to ensure the medium to long-term housing needs of affected communities are addressed. The Honourable Steve Thomas. Thank you, President. Uh, my question without notice, of which some notice has been given, is to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Housing. I refer to the Key Start Shared Home Ownership Home Loan Scheme and I ask one, as of the 30th of April 2021, how many shared ownership home loans does Key Start administer? Two, of this number of shared ownership home loans, how many loans are flexible shared ownership loans and how many are fixed share ownership loans? Three, over the past, far past four financial years, how many borrowers have refinanced their properties or bought more shares in their properties? 
for how many of the shared ownership loans currently administered by, administered by Keystart were funded at the maximum 30 per cent of purchase price, and five, what is the current interest rate applied to Keystart shared home loans? Uh, Leader of the House. President, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. One, 3,810. Two, 175 loans are fixed and 3,635 loans are flexible. Three, since the 1st of July 2017, a total of 883 loans have closed or refinanced and 29 have bought more shares. Four, as at 30th of April 2021, 733 loans had a 30 per cent housing authority share. Five, Keystart's interest rate setting policy is to adjust rates in line with the average standard variable rates offered by the big four banks. Interest rates are only one component of the total cost of a home loan, and while Keystart's interest rate is not the lowest in the market, it is comparable with rates that a buyer with a minimal deposit or equity will be offered by other lenders at 4.54 per cent. Uh, the Hon. Jorn Sidmer. Um, my question, without notice of which some notice is given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Minister for Electoral Affairs, question C163. I refer to the process the government intends to follow in reneging on repeated commitments given by the Premier during the campaign that electoral reform of the Upper House was, quote, is not on the government's agenda, end quote, and I ask one, is it the government's official policy position that non-metropolitan Western Australia is presently overrepresented in the Legislative Council? Two, if yes to one, by a measure of seats currently occupied in the chamber, how many are considered superfluous to the government's conception of electoral equality? And three, how many seats in the agricultural, mining and pastoral and south west regions must be sacrificed to achieve this model of perfection? Uh, the Parliamentary <laughs> Secretary to the Attorney General. Uh, thank you, President. And I thank the member for some notice of the question. And I provide the following response on behalf of the Minister for Electoral Affairs. One to three, the government has not reneged on any election commitment. The government has responded to widely expressed community concern about an, an anomalous outcomes following the 2021 general election by establishing the Ministerial Expert Committee and has asked it to recommend how electoral equality might be achieved for all citizens entitled to vote for the Legislative Council. The committee is yet to report and the government will consider the options once they have been presented. The Honourable Nick Guerin. Uh, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Parliamentary Secretary representing the Attorney General. I refer to question on notice number 74, asked and answered on the 11th of May 2021, regarding the roundtable discussion to address the urgent need for new courts for criminal trials. And I ask one, did the roundtable discussion take place on the 18th of May 2021? Two, if yes to one, who was invited? Three, further to two, who attended the roundtable discussion? Four, will the Minister table the briefing note or other documents he received from his staff or his department in preparation for the meeting? Five, will the Minister table the minutes and or documents recording the outcomes from the meeting? And six, if no to four or five, why not? Uh, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Attorney General. Thank you, uh, President, and uh, I thank the member for some notice of the question. I provide the following response on behalf of the Attorney General. One, yes. Two, the Chief Justice of WA, the Honourable Peter Quinlan, the Chief Judge of the District Court, the Honourable Julie uh, Wager, uh, the Department of Justice Director General, Dr Adam Thomason, Department of Justice Executive Director of Court and Tribunal Services Joanne Stampalia, Director of Public Prosecutions Amanda Forrester, a representative from the Department of Finance, the Attorney General and staff. Three, in addition to those listed in part two, a second representative from the Department of Finance attended. Uh, four to six, I ask the member uh, to place the remainder of the question on notice to allow further time to seek advice prior to responding. The Honourable Peter Collier. He's given this letter of the House representing the Premier. Credit the Premier's response to question C1066 on Wednesday, the 8th of October 2020, and to documents 337 of the Lottery West FOI reference to 1862. And I ask one, why was the response to the answer provided by Lottery West to the Premier's office replaced with, quote, one to three decisions on grant applications from Lottery West made by the Lottery West Board, which is independent of government? And two, why was the response to question C1066 from Lottery West redacted from the FOI document? Ah, the Leader of the House. Uh, thanks, President. I thank the Honourable Member for some notice of the question. I um, assume the Member is referring to his question without notice on Wednesday, the 7th of October 2020. One, Ministers are responsible for answers provided to Parliament. Two, as the Honourable Member would be aware, his FOI shows that it is redacted under Clause 12C of Schedule 1 to the Freedom of Information Act 1992 on the basis that the public disclosure of that matter would infringe the privileges of Parliament. 
The Honourable Martin Nordridge. Thank you, President. My question without notice or some notice has been given to the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Emergency Services. I refer to the emergency situation declarations under Section 50 of the Emergency Management Act 2005 in relation to the Wurrulu bushfire and tropical cyclone Sarosia and ask one, has the State Recovery Coordination, co coordination Group been established for each event? And if so, on what date was each created? Two, what is the membership of each SC SRCG? Three, how many reports from each SRCG have been provided to government and on what dates were each provided? Four, please table a copy in each of each report identified in three. And five, has an impact statement been prepared and provided to affected local government authorities? If so, please table each impact statement. Leader of the House. President, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The Department of Fire and Emergency Services DFES advises one and SRCG Group was established for the Wurrulu bushfires on the 5th of February 2021, and an SRCG was established for Tropical Cyclone Saroja on the 22nd of April 2021. The membership of each uh, SRCG is um, now, um, President. There are three, quite two, quite long lists of. Um, agencies represented. I wonder if I might um, seek leave to have those incorporated into Hansard? The Leader seeks leave to have the list of names incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Thank you, President. Three, no official reports have been provided to government. Four, and uh, not applicable. Five, impact statements have been prepared and provided to the local governments impacted by the Wurrulu bushfire. Impact statements are currently being developed for the local governments impacted by tropical cyclone Saroja. Given that the documents contain personal and sensitive information, I ask the member to pay, place this question uh, on notice, this part of the question on notice, so that proper consideration can be given. Uh, the Honourable Neil Thompson. Thank you, President. My question without notice, for which some notice is given, the Leader of the House representing the Minister for Ports. I refer to the compensation scheme for homeowners of Port Hedland's dust affected West End and I ask uh, why does the state use fix, a fixed price to base its compensation when nor our normal approach would be to use an unencumbered and existi existing valuation plus uh, where appropriate a salatum uh, to compensate landowners where it seeks to acquire those properties either voluntarily or compulsorily. Leader of the House. President, thank you. I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. The Port Hedland Voluntary Buyback Scheme, PHVBS, is not a compensation scheme, nor is it designed to, prom to provide compensation for changes in market value that have occurred over time. The PHVBS is to provide a voluntary option for owners of residential dwellings within the area of land between Taplin Street and the port in the west end uh, of Port Hedland to secure a guaranteed settlement price following the introduction of rezoning related to the Port Hedland West End Improvement Scheme No. 1, ISI 1. Uh, participation in this scheme is voluntary. The 6th of August 2019 was the valuation date set, as it was when the Minister for Regional Development first publicly indicated that the State Government would consider how an industry-funded uh, PHVBS would operate. The 6th of August 2019 date for valuation was accepted after investigations found uh, there was no other date that would distinguish the West End from other local areas, East End of Port Hedland and other Pilbara locations. The PHVBS is, offer is not a fixed price. At the time the offer is made, eligible residential property owners will be offered a settlement price calculated as follows. The agreed market value of the property as at August 6, uh, 2019 indexed, a premium of 35 per cent of the agreed market value and an amount of up to $20,000 for verifiable transaction costs. The Honourable Jorn Sidmer. Thank you very much. Uh, my question without notice, uh, of which some notice is provided, is to the Minister representing the Minister for Environment. I, I refer to part two of the answer the Minister provided yesterday regarding consultation with commercial and recreational fishing groups on the Conservation and Land Management Amendment Bill 2021, and I ask one, Noting that the last recorded contact with Wreckfish West was on 8 September 2020, and the last recorded contact with the Western Australian Fishing Industry Council, or WAFIC, was on 24 September 2020, is the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions advising that it has had no contact with affected marine park users for eight months before the minister decided to reintroduce the bill? And two, 
Which affected stakeholders has DBCA engaged with on the bill, aside from Wreckfish West and Wafik, since September last year? The Minister for Mental Health. Thanks very much, President, and I thank the Honourable Member for some notes of the question. Honourable Member, the answer to that question is not in my folder. I have seen it, so I will ask the advisers to run it in and I'll provide it at the end of the question time. So I'll allow one more question. Uh, the Honourable Donna Farragher. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, President, my question, without notice of which some notice has been given, is to the Minister for Education. I refer to community kindergartens operating in Western Australia and I ask, will the Minister provide a breakdown of the total funding allocated to each community kindergarten in 2021 for A, operational grant funding, B, staffing costs, C, linked school administration support and D, any other costs not listed above? Leader of the House. Uh, I thank the honourable member for some notice of the question. Um, now, the answer is provided in tabular form and I'll um, seek leave to have that incorporated in Hansard, but perhaps if I describe it first. Um, it lists the community kindergartens, uh, then it lists the 2021 grant, uh, salaries, teachers and education assistance, admin support for linked schools, total 2021 funding, term one, 2021 funding for enhanced cleaning due to COVID-19, term two, 2021 funding for enhanced cleaning due to COVID-19, total 2021 funding, including funding for enhanced cleaning due to COVID-19, and I um, seek leave to have that incorporated into Hansard. The Leader of the House seeks leave to have that table incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? Aye. Leave is granted. Leader of the House. The House be resumed. The business of the House is resumed. Are there any... Is this a point of order? Yes, Okay. Thank you. Just with regard to a question that I received, response I received today from C166 from the Premier, and he's referred me to Legislative Council question 144. Um, I've asked uh, the Assistant Clerk to check on 144, and it actually refers to a question asked back on the 13th of March 2019 on a completely different topic. So I think they're confused. So if I could get a response to that and a response tomorrow. Seek to provide a response. Thanks, Leader of the House. That is not a point of order, but thank you for the response. Uh, from the leader, the Honourable Martin Aldrich. Uh, thanks, President. Um, I asked a question today of the Minister representing the Minister for Health, C171, in relation to hotel quarantine. Um, I think the um, person who signed off on this question has perhaps misinterpreted part of the question, which is part four of the question, where I asked um, of those identified in three, how many invoices have been issued within three timeframes? And the answer was. Um, a to C, to date all invoices have been issued within 60 days or more. Can I ask for some clarification as to the answer to that question? My, uh, President, uh, I read the answer as everything was 60 days afterwards, but I'll, noting that you've raised the, um, raised the point, point of order, I will seek some clarification and uh, provide an updated response to the Chamber tomorrow. Thank you, Minister for Mental Health. Are there any further answers? Uh, Minister for Mental Health. President, earlier today in, in question time, the Honourable Bjorn Sidmer asked me a question uh, representing the Minister for Environment. Uh, I now provide that answer. One to two. The Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions, DBCA, maintains an ongoing consultative relationship with a broad range of stakeholders, including commercial and recreational fishing groups, traditional owners, conservation groups and other users of Western Australia's marine parks. The bill was passed by the Legislative Assembly on 17 November 2020, and the 40th Parliament was prorogued, prorogued prior to it reaching the Legislative Council. In the event that the bill is amended, DBCA will recommence specific consultation with relevant stakeholders. Are there any further answers from ministers or parliamentary secretaries? No? Okay, members, we move back to orders of the day.